Jeff will continue his lecture on geometric clusters on the Okay. Um, thanks. The introduction. Okay, so so um, last time we we introduced G, uh, GX structures on manifolds uh, and their uh, developing maps and holonomy representations, and we began to investigate the connection between uh, the properties of the geometric structure, the geometry, and the behavior of the of the holonomy representation. In particular, we looked at uh, complete structures. Um, which, you know, for example, are geodesically complete if there's a, a connection. And we saw that their holonomy representations are actually discrete faithful acting properly discontinuously on X. So today I want to focus on uh, a different class of, of geometric structures, convex geometric structures. So um, to begin with, uh, I, don't, I don't want to talk about just closed manifolds anymore. I'd like to, I'd like to talk about manifolds with boundaries. So I want to allow uh, my manifold M uh, to have non-empty uh, non boundary. And so what's a GX structure on a manifold with boundary? Well, let's, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but let's just say, what is it? Well, it's a, it's a GX structure on the interior of M uh, that extends, uh, well, yeah, that can be thickened so I've got the interior of M contained in, in M, so I include its boundary, I want that to be contained in a larger M prime which is uh, some open manifold, some thickening of, of M. And I, uh, yeah, so I want this to be a larger GX manifold such that the restriction here is the, the GX structure that we started with. And note here, I, I, don't, I don't require, I don't require that the boundary of M is smooth. Okay, so I, in particular, I'd, I'd like to consider geometric structures on M where maybe the boundary um, looks like a, a pleated surface or something, a bent, a bent surface. Okay, um, great. So let's uh, focus now on hyperbolic geometry for this 45 minutes. Um, so remember that's the group POD1 acting on the d-dimensional hyperbolic space, POD1 is just the, the Lie group uh, uh, of isometries of the hyperbolic space. OK. So a, and, and let me abbreviate, instead of writing the group and the space, I'll just write the space, an, an HD manifold M uh, is convex, and here I'm allowing M to have boundary. If uh, any path in M is homotopic to a geodesic segment. 
And I mean, of course, homotopic rel endpoints, fixing the endpoints. So any path in M can be straightened out to a geodesic still living inside of M. OK? Um, sort of an obvious uh, property here is that if I take the developing map for such a structure, um, well, that's actually an embedding. So it's embedding of, of M tilde that identifies M tilde with C, uh, a convex, convex subset of, H, of, of HD. OK, why, why is it injective? Well, right, two points here have a path between them. Uh, that path can be straightened to a geodesic. And geodesics in HD have unique endpoints, right? So there's no geodesic in HD that comes back to itself. <laughs> what? Uh, distinct. Yeah, why, why is it injective? I have two points here. I want to see that they go to different points here. I draw a path between them. If these are genuinely diff different paths here, that, that path is not homotopic to the trivial path. So it can be straightened. And that, straighten, that straight line develops to a straight line here. And straight lines never come back and cross themselves. OK, um, great. So uh, another property, since the developing map is an embedding, the holonomy representation, again, as with complete structures, uh, is also discrete and faithful. And it acts properly discontinuously on, on C. In fact, C mod Hall is naturally exactly the, the hyperbolic manifold now. OK. So I, I, you know, I said this thing about structures with boundary because in general, you know, I, I don't want to care. I, I want to be able to take any convex set in HD, even if it has some sort of polyhedral or, or sort of uh, complicated boundary. And I want to be able to form uh, hyperbolic manifolds by taking quotients. OK. Is that clear? Good. OK, so the main theorem that we'll talk about in this segment is the following. Um, so this is you know, a classical theorem. Uh, that I'm not quite sure who to attribute to, but you can see, for example, a paper of uh, Bowditch from, I believe, 95, um, which treats a, a much more complicated setting that particularly includes these, uh, includes this statement. So, um, all right. So, like gamma, a torsion free group, uh, rho, from gamma to POD1, uh, a representation. And that's it. Then the following are equivalent. OK, so I'm going to number these with letters to indicate, uh, indicate what, they're, what these properties are about. So the first one is called CS. Um, it says that there exists a manifold M. Um, which is compact. It's a compact convex HD manifold. Okay. Uh, such that, well, pi 1 of m is isomorphic to gamma, and let's identify it with gamma. And rho is the holonomy representation of the hyperbolic structure on F. OK? So this property is just saying this representation is a holonomy representation of a compact convex hyperbolic manifold. OK, the next one I'll abbreviate QI. Uh, and that says that gamma is finitely generated 
and rho is a quasi-isometric embedding. Okay, and we've already encountered these um, in Andres's course, but let me just remind you real quickly what, what this means in this context. Um, this means that uh, the orbit map, maybe I'll write it over here. This means that the orbit map um, from gamma into hyperbolic space, which takes a, a group element gamma and maps it to rho of gamma applied to the base point, means that this is a quasi-isometric embedding. That means that there exists constants L and A such that um, this map is an isometry up to multiplicative uh, error by L and additive error by A. 1 over L uh, d gamma between, say, gamma 1 and gamma 2 uh, is less than or equal to, oh, I'm sorry, minus A, is less than or equal to the distance in the hyperbolic D space between rho of gamma 1 applied to x0 and rho of gamma 2 applied to x0. And that's less than or equal to L times the distance between gamma 1 and gamma 2 in the group plus A. OK, so they're quasi the same metric. OK, of course, what does this mean? This is the word length in the group, the word distance. For that, I need a generating set, um, a finite generating set. So gamma is finitely generated. It won't matter in a minute, but a priori, there could, there could be a dependence on this uh, metric um, even beyond quasi-isometry on the generating set, but let's just say there exists there exists a generating set so that this is true. Okay. The third property is abbreviated BE. Okay, and that says gamma is hyperbolic. And there exists a boundary embedding a map C from the Gromov boundary of the group into the visual boundary of the hyperbolic space, uh, which is continuous, uh, continuous uh, row, row equivariant, yeah, row equivariant. the continuous row equivariant embedding. OK? So in particular, we can see the boundary of this group naturally as a subset of the boundary of hyperbolic space in a, in a row equivariant way, in a way that respects the representation. OK. Um, if any of these equivalent conditions hold, uh, And we'll call rho uh, convex co-compact. So this is what this is what uh, convex co-compact representation in the PSD one refers to. Any of these conditions. Okay. Questions about the statements? Is it clear? Okay. So examples. Um, include, well, so this is, it's nice to have this equivalence because we can actually make lots of examples in different ways. So the first way is just to make a compact convex hyperbolic manifold. And that is you know, actually pretty easy to do. Uh, one way to do it is to take convex pieces of hyperbolic space and glue them together in a convex way. So for example, um, I could take two right angled, I could, I could take uh, one right angled hexagon uh, in the hyperbolic plane, uh, and I can choose to double it along 
uh, three uh, alternating sides. OK? This is a convex set. It's a convex polygon in the hyperbolic plane. When I double it, I'm gluing a copy of itself to itself. Uh, I'm, gluing, I'm gluing a copy of it to another copy of it uh, in a convex way, because we have right angles here. And what I get is a three-hold sphere. Uh, what I get is a compact, convex, hyperbolic structure on the three-hold sphere, where the boundary is actually uh, totally geodesic, geodesic boundary. OK? So there, I just made a, I just made a compact, convex, hyperbolic manifold. By this theorem, its holonomy representation has these nice, nice properties. OK. I can also make representations which are, which are quasi-isometric embeddings. Um, for example, Schottky groups. So there's an exercise in the problem session which will ask you to prove that the Schottky groups we constructed last time are, are quasi-isometric embeddings. It's very easy to, to see that. Um, OK. And for boundary embedded, Uh, the nice one class of nice examples where it's easy to see this are the quasi Fuchsian surface group representations. Uh, and uh, in this case, let's stick to dimension three. The quasi Fuchsian representation is a quasi conformal deformation of a Fuchsian representation. Fuchsian representations are obviously boundary embedded. Um, and when you deform them by a, by a quasi-conformal homeomorphism, you deform that boundary embedding. So you still see it very concretely. Um, you still see the boundary of the group in the, in the boundary of hyperbolic space. OK, good. So I want to um, prove this, or give you the idea of how this is proved. That'll take most of the time. And it'll give us an excuse to introduce some ideas uh, that are useful. Okay. Okay. All right, so let's prove that convex structure implies uh, quasi-isometrically embedded. OK. So I've got M, a compact convex hyperbolic manifold, whose holonomy representation is the representation I'm interested in. So what I do is I take the image of the developing map. Uh, that's a convex, it's actually closed. Closed convex subset of hyperbolic space. Um, and gamma acts on C uh, properly, uh, discontinuously, and co compactly. OK. So the nice thing, uh, the, the important thing here, is that a convex. Uh, subset of HD. So if I take my convex set and I make it a metric space by just using the hyperbolic metric, uh, this is a geodesic metric space. Right? I can realize the distance between two points uh, with a straight line in the, in the space. OK, so uh, this, this implication then follows from, uh, I think I'm going to call it fact one. Uh, it's often known as the, the Schwartz-Milner lemma, that if, uh, let's see, if f is a, is a uh, hold on, let's see, hold on. Uh, right. So if c 
is a geodesic space. Uh, and gamma acts on C properly, co-compactly, by isometries. Uh, then the orbit map uh, is a, is a quasi-isometry. It's not just a quasi-isometric embedding, but it's actually a quasi-isometry. Okay? Okay, so this is an extremely useful lemma in, in geometric group theory. Um, it, in particular, it gives us that condition two holds. What about the finite generation? Well, what this really means is there is some generating set of gamma with respect to, a, you know, determined with respect to a fundamental domain in C for this action for which this is true. Okay. Uh, all right, so that was easy. Um, what about, uh, okay. All right, what about QI implies uh, boundary embedded? Okay, so uh, this is another, this follows from a, another useful fact. Uh, okay, do I have room to write it here? Let's see. Um, yeah, I think I can write it here. Uh, okay, so fact two. All right, so if F if F is a quasi isometric embedding of um, of geodesic, let me just I'll say it out loud. Is a quasi isometric embedding of, of geodesic uh, metric spaces. And uh, actually, give myself a little more room here. All right, that was And why is uh, delta hyperbolic? Okay. Then x is delta prime hyperbolic. Um, and f extends. Um, to a, a unique map, which we'll call boundary infinity of f, of the union of x with its visual boundary uh, to the union of y with its visual boundary. So if I take x and I, put, and I stick on its visual boundary, remember the visual boundary, Andres talked about this, but let me remind you, the visual boundary is the space of geodesic rays up to the equivalence uh, of, bounded, of bounded distance. Um, okay, and that's a very nice object in a, in a delta hyperbolic uh, metric space. Okay, so Yeah, okay, so let me say it extends to uh, this and boundary infinity of F is a continuous embedding. And it's uniquely determined by F, so um, the row equivariance in condition BE comes from that uniqueness. Okay, um, great. And just, if you haven't seen this before, probably a lot of you have, but if you haven't seen this before, you know, why should you expect an extension to the boundary? <coughs> well, if you have a ray in X, so here's, here's X, the outside of, of this picture is its, its 
boundary, so we can think of adding little endpoints to, to geodesic rays. If I map this over with f to, uh, to y, what's the image of this, this picture? Well, it's some sort of quasi-geodesic, right? So it's a, qua a quasi-geodesic ray. It's, it's an LA quasi-geodesic ray. Um, so that's not, that's not naturally an element of the visual boundary of Y. It's not a geodesic ray. However, uh, the Morse lemma says that any quasi-geodesic ray is actually a uh, bounded distance from a unique, uh, unique geodesic ray in Y. Okay, so this quasi-geodesic ray actually tracks very close to a geodesic ray. Um, and that gives you the, the, the definition of the boundary map. Okay. All right. So uh, that one was also easy. Um, all right. So I want to actually focus on the third one. Um, I'll give you an argument for the, oh, sorry, the implication BE implies CS. I'll give you an argument for this that's maybe slightly different than what the standard argument might be. It's different than the, it is related to, but different, uh, different than one of the arguments that, that Andres mentioned yesterday. Um, oh, no, 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 I wanted to save this. Let's see. Okay. Uh, did I, whatever, okay. Um, all right, so BE implies CS. All right. Um, all right, so I have BE. I have the gamma is hyperbolic, and I have a, a row equivariant uh, embedding of its of its uh, of its Gromov boundary in the boundary of, of hyperbolic space. So let me denote by lambda the image of this row equivariant embedding. So it's an invariant, a row of gamma invariant subset of the boundary of hyperbolic space. All right, so here's a picture. Here's hyperbolic space. And maybe uh, gamma is a surface group, uh, in which case its Gromov boundary is a circle, right? Uh, and maybe rho is a quasi-Fuchsian representation, in which case we'd see uh, some sort of topological invariant circle uh, like this. Okay, so this is lambda. All right, so what am I going to do? I want to make a convex hyperbolic manifold out of this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the convex hull. Um, it's kind of hard to draw this. But. So I'm going to take the convex hull of this, this subset of the boundary. So what's that? So let's let C be the convex hull of lambda. Uh, a closed subset of, a closed convex subset of hyperbolic space. Yeah, so what is that? It's, um, if you like, it's the smallest closed convex subset uh, which accumulates on, on lambda. Okay, so it's really, it's the smallest closed convex subset that contains lambda uh, in, its, in its closure and the compactification of hyperbolic space. Okay. It's also a union of, of simplices, of ideal simplices spanned by points, points in lambda. That's a little harder to see. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to take this thing. Since lambda is invariant, C is, is invariant. This thing is uniquely determined by lambda. Okay. So I'm going to take the quotient uh, C. Let's see. Um, yeah, I guess I should say, I, I need to say that, um, in fact, it's, yeah, it's, it's clear since, um, 
since, an equi since a boundary embedding exists, that, that row is discrete and faithful. But, so let's ignore that. Um, I'm going to take this quotient, which is naturally a, a convex HD manifold. And I want to show it's compact. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to do that. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to try to project it onto something that I know is compact already. And I'm going to show the fiber of that projection is compact. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a projection map to the space of triples of lambda. OK? Uh, this, the action of rho of gamma here, is co-compact because this uh, identifies with the space of triples of the boundary of the group. Um, let me write it this way. And gamma acts co-compactly uh, on the space of triples uh, in the boundary of the group, distinct triples. Um, so the action here is also, also co-compact. All right, so how on earth do I project a convex set to uh, the space of triples in the boundary? Well, a triple in the boundary of the group is an ideal triangle in the hyperbolic space. So if I take the space of distinct, distinct triples in the boundary of hyperbolic space, that's naturally the space of ideal triangles. Okay? So I've got three points in lambda. Okay, so maybe this is in the hyperbolic plane now. Okay, I can connect them. They're convex hull is an ideal triangle. And I can take the center of this ideal triangle. There's a well-defined midpoint of this triangle, where the, uh, which is equidistant from, from all three edges. And I believe uh, these lengths are always, uh, these lengths are each uh, log of 2 root 2. Uh, I did that last night on a napkin. That could be wrong. Um, OK, so here's the center. It's uniquely determined by the triangle. OK, so what am I going to do? I'm going to define pi of x. So I take a point x and c. I'm going to send it to its, the, the center. I'm going to send it to the, the triangle whose center is closest. Uh, yeah, so this, I should say this is the, this is the center. Or bear, you know, Barry Center. I don't know. Um, midpoint. Uh, so I'm going to send it to to the to the the ideal triangle, such that uh, such that C. Uh, let me write it this way. Such that the distance from X to C. Um, is minimal. OK. Uh, you might object, how do you know there's a unique minimum? Of course, there might not be a unique minimum. This is really a coarse map. Really, you're mapping each point to sort of a small collection of a compact collection of triples in here. But let's not worry about that. OK, nothing is a problem there. OK. So that's great. So to finish the proof, so this is you know continuous and uh, you know this is a reasonable, a coarsely continuous map. Um, so all we need to do now is to show that the fibers are compact. 
okay? Oh, yeah, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's equivariant. So I have an e yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. Thank you, Nico. That's a good point. So you can you can you can now immediately say that the action is properly discontinuous. If you can come up with any reasonable projection, even a coarse one, from your um, from your set C to a space where you already know the action is properly discontinuous, then you can conclude that the action on C is properly discontinuous. Yeah. So thanks. This implies that. And it's, it's, well, I guess I forgot to assume that, oh, I did assume that gamma is torsion free. So it's, it's automatically free. Okay. Um, all right, so why is the fiber compact? Okay, so um, suppose not. So suppose we have a sequence in C going to infinity such that uh, pi of xn is the same triple. OK. In particular, the distance from xn to the center of any triple, so remember, this one is the closest. So the distance to the center of any triple is going to infinity uniformly uniformly over all triples. OK, great. So I'm going to take a limit. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to let gn in POD1 take xn to the base point. Some choice there, compact choice. Um, and at the subsequence, uh, the image of my limit set lambda is going to converge uh, in the Hausdorff sense, to some set lambda infinity in the boundary. Okay, so maybe you need a subsequence here, but don't worry about that. And let me further refine the subsequence, uh, if necessary. It's not uh, so that C converges. So this is in the boundary of H D. This is in H D. To some closed convex subset in hyperbolic space. OK, so I claim that lambda infinity has to have at most two points in it. Why is that? If it had three points, that's a triangle, right? So if there's a triangle here, then there's a triangle here that's very close to that triangle, which would have bounded distance uh, from the base point x0. So that would mean that, that this is not happening. OK, so this set ha can't have three points. It has to have at most two. Um, and then we're basically done. But, but let me just remark, this set is not empty either. Uh, the, the, the convex set and the limit, C infinity, is not empty either. So actually, yeah, sorry, we're not, we need to say this. Um, the number of points in this set is, is at most two. Uh, sorry, it's at least two. If this had one, oh yeah, let me let me say it's clear from uh, that this limiting uh, convex set is the convex hull of the limiting lambdas. So so since this isn't empty, this has to have more than one point because the convex hull of one point would be would be empty. Okay, so it's equal to two. And then uh, I'll leave it as a lemma for you. I think I forgot to include in the exercises, but feel free to work on this. Um, if a, a closed set lambda in uh, the boundary of hyperbolic space, um, okay, if lambda is closed in the boundary of hyperbolic space, uh, and gn is a sequence. This is more general than the, the situation we're in, so let's write it again. Uh, 
such that gn applied to lambda converges to some lambda infinity uh, with lambda infinity having two points, then the, the lambda that you started with has an isolated point. OK? So if you can take your subset of, of the boundary of hyperbolic space and use, use isometries to, to push it around so that it converges into two points, um, actually, really, you had an isolated point, and you were just using a, you know, a loxodromic element to push everything away from that point. OK. Um, and that's, that's the end of the proof, because uh, because, as Andres said, the boundaries of groups are, are perfect sets. They don't, they don't have isolated points, with the exception of the boundary of Z. But I'll leave that case to you. OK, any questions about that? Yeah. Uh, why is lambda closed? No, I mean, you said lambda equals the image. Yes. That, that lambda is closed, or that C is closed. It could be the whole boundary of HD. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Um, no, it's so. So I'm assuming. I'm assuming that C is an embedding. Yeah, it's an embedding of a compact set. It, it's it's closed. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it's not enough to just have any old map here. Like maybe you're thinking of a geometrically infinite surface group or something. That, then, you, then you do have a, a Canon Thurston map, but it's, it's not an embedding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any other questions? OK, so I'm going to take five minutes now uh, to motivate the next part. Um, OK, so this is great. This is classical. Many of you in this room probably know these things already. Um, and a major theme of gear is you know, how do we do the things we love in hyperbolic space in higher rank groups? Um, so what about higher rank? Um, let me see. I want to say this. So, so you might ask, OK, convex co-compactness is great. In POD1, got these three conditions are equivalent, allow us to make lots of examples. I'll just say vaguely, almost all discrete faithful representations in POD1 are convex co-compact. Um, you know, the vast majority of them are. So the natural thing to do would be to try to come up with a theory of, of holonomy representations of convex structures in higher rank symmetric spaces. So let's let G be a simple, uh, simple Lie group of rank uh, bigger than or equal to 2. And let's let x be the Ramanian symmetric space uh, associated to G. OK, so that's like you know, the higher rank version of the hyperbolic plane here, or hyperbolic space. OK, so um, unfortunately, the theory of convex co-compact representations in this setting is um, very boring. So I wanted to tell you why, but I'm just going to tell you the, the theorem. Um, this is due to, to, to Kant and, and Kleiner-Lieb in around 2005. And I'm, I'm going to state it in a way that uh, suits the context of this talk rather than the way that they stated it. Um, OK. Suppose M is a compact convex GX manifold 
where g and x are, are here. OK. All right. And suppose, uh, OK, well, let me write it this way. Then there are two possibilities. One, well, there could be no boundary. So if the boundary is empty, then M is a closed uh, GX manifold. And the holonomy representation uh, is a lattice. Its image is a lattice, a uniform lattice. Right? It's acting co-compactly. It's acting co-compactly. Remember, um, this is a Ramanian geometry. So um, closed manifolds are complete by the hopf renault theorem. So if we have a closed GX manifold, its uh, developing map is a diffeomorphism, and its holonomy representation uh, acts freely, properly, discontinuously, and co-compactly. It's a uniform lattice. OK. So uniform lattices are good, but what if the boundary of M, uh, that of course applies in the, the hyperbolic setting too. Uh, what if the boundary of M is not empty? You say, ah, great, I'm going to get quasi Fuchsian groups and, and Schottky groups and lots of cool things like, like this. And unfortunately, no. If, if the boundary is empty, then the image of the holonomy representation, uh, let me say it this way, uh, is not Zariski dense. Well, OK. So I can avoid telling you what Zariski dense means, is contained in a Lie group H, a Lie subgroup whose dimension uh, is smaller than the dimension of G. So if you have a convex, compact GX structure modeled on a Ramanian symmetric space of higher rank, and it has boundary, then its holonomy representation lives in a smaller subgroup, which is a product of rank one groups, in fact. Um, so they're you know, guided by the, the sort of intuition that most representations do not satisfy this property. Most representations should just go everywhere in G. They should be Zariski dense. This is telling you the holonomy representations of, of compact convex GX manifolds are an extremely small subset of the representations of a group gamma into G. And so this theory is not super useful if you're trying to understand big families of representations in higher rank Lie groups. So in the next 45 minutes, I'll tell you uh, what to do instead. A different type of geometry that you can use to cover a much larger class of representations and still work with some sort of convex geometry. OK, thanks. I was almost on time. I'm, I'm proud of myself. Yeah.